Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Woo! Welcome to our very early panel. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, you've made it. Congrats. I can't you say very early morning like it's like it's 5 a.m. and not it's, like 10 a.m. It's very Magfest early. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Kleback. Uh, I build things, and I'm part of the Indie Arcade downstairs. Uh, I'm Amanda Hudgens, and I'm an experiential designer. Uh, I'm Nate Mattingly, and I'm a woodworker and part of the Indie Arcade. Hi, my name is Alan Riley. I'm a video artist, uh, designer of the arcade cabinet Video Freak, which is down in the Indie Arcade, and I'm a member of Death by Audio Arcade. Uh, so this is our second how to build an arcade cabinet panel. We did one last year, and uh, it's hosted on our YouTube channel. We built the cabinet Kung Fu Kickball, uh, which is down in the Indie Arcade this year. Um, last year, we decided to build kind of a more traditional arcade cabinet, uh, an upright four-player cabinet. And this year, we decided to do something a little different. Um, so we'll be talking about how we built Sententable. Sententable. Uh, which is Amanda's game. Uh, so, uh, a little bit about us first. Um, so we're a nonprofit. We're called Death by Audio Arcade. Uh, we're based in Brooklyn, New York, and we build custom arcade cabinets. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we started building cabinets in 2013, and as of now, we've built probably something like 30 arcade cabinets, but also other installations, uh, games, photo booths, and things like that, um, interactive installations. Uh, the reason for our name is because we grew out of a place called Death by Audio, which was a music venue and guitar pedal workshop in Williamsburg. Uh, and so I was working with them, learning how to build guitar pedals, and out of that uh, guitar pedal company, a music venue uh, was founded. And the music venue had bands uh, come through Brooklyn, and in the back was a bar, and uh, I decided to build a MAME arcade to put in the bar. Uh, there was also an artist space in the back, and a bunch of people lived in this warehouse, and there was a woodworking shop, and there was screen printing, so there was a lot of resources in the same building for uh, just building things. And so it was a really inspiring place, and I learned a lot about fabrication uh, from just you know, uh, experimenting with wood tools and paint and different kinds of things. Um, so this was the first cabinet uh, that I built. We had an eMac, which uh, was the predecessor of the iMac. And uh, it was just lying around, but it worked. And I installed some MAME software on it and just followed some blogs about how to hook up joysticks and buttons. And um, you know, some of you may have been down this road. It's really easy. There's tons of people building MAME cabinets out there. Now you can do the whole thing on a Raspberry Pi. You don't need to dig out old computers from the trash. Um, but this was really cool. And um, you know, we had a functioning coin door, and people could play these old arcade machines while they were at the venue. Um, and then over the last couple of years, I started meeting folks who were making indie games from the NYU Game Center, from um, other schools, and asking them to put their games inside of custom arcade cabinets. And that's sort of how we founded this uh, nonprofit. And uh, in 2014, we started coming to MAGFest and just bringing our cabinets. And about two years ago, we created our own department called the Indie Arcade. Um, the head of the Indie Arcade is uh, Kyle Magox, who is uh, maybe going to be here. Um, but I'll have his contact info. And um, if you are interested in learning more about the Indie Arcade at MAGFest, talk to me or him. Um, and so. Since 2013, uh, Death by Audio closed. Uh, a lot of you know, underground warehouse spaces are tough to maintain. So at this point, we had about 10 arcade cabinets that became nomadic. And so we would talk to different bars and galleries and uh, anyone who would take us and bring our arcades for one month, two month residencies. Um, and so. There was a lot of box truck driving. There was a lot of you know, carrying arcade cabinets up flights of stairs. Uh, it was fun for a little bit. 
we incorporated as a not-for-profit, which is amazing, um, and now we can apply for grants. Um, and so we have a membership program, and we have members in New York, and we do workshops, and um, kind of like how to build uh, things. And this past year, we successfully crowdfunded a new bar slash indie arcade in Brooklyn called Wonderville. And so uh, we opened in May, and now our collection has a permanent home. And so if you ever visit Brooklyn, I would invite you to come and visit us. Uh, if you build indie games, please talk to us, because we're showcasing games all the time. And so uh, after we finish this cabinet, it will come back with us to Wonderville. And so uh, it's a little bit of a history about where this organization came from. And also, uh, as we go through the build, I just want to say, if anyone has questions, please raise your hand because it's probably easier to take them as they happen rather than all at once at the end, especially because we're going to talk a lot about building. Um, so yeah, feel free. So building an arcade cabinet. Uh, choosing a game. Uh, we have like a couple people that work on a curatorial team. And when we are thinking about arcade games, we have a lot of considerations to keep in mind. Uh, is this easy to approach, especially for people who aren't familiar with video games? You know, if people come into a bar and they press a button, does it start automatically? Um, is the button and joystick interface easy to learn? You know, is there a bunch of menus or does it just go right into the game? Uh, I think designing for arcades is a little bit different from designing for, you know, a console or something like that. Um, Kung Fu Kickball last year was a game that we had been playing at the MIVS booth uh, for a couple of years, and we were really big fans. And uh, it's a really big hit. And so this year, we started thinking about different kinds of interfaces. And Centenable was something that was at the Indie Arcade for a few years. And because of all of the buttons and the you know randomness of it and just the button mashing, the interface was really playful. And it was something that we wanted to experiment with. Um, so, uh, I'll hand it over to Amanda. <laughs> um, so, hi. Uh, this is Sentendable. Uh, it is a fighting game. It has 100 buttons. Um, uh, it's 50 per player. Hmm? Oh, you want me to like really get in here? Hi. Um, yeah, so this is Sentendable. It's a fighting game. It has 100 buttons. Um, I built it in 2017 for an art show from where I'm from, which is from Kentucky. Um, it has 50 buttons for each side, and uh, they randomize at the start of every round, and they also all do a different thing. So different controls, different visual effects, etc. It's... Um, I really wanted to capture that feeling of when you're like eight and you go to your cousin's house for the first time and they have Mortal Kombat and you don't and then they beat you and then they destroy you. Um, I really wanted you to feel like both sides of that equation uh, because I've never been on the good side. Um, I'm really bad at fighting games so I made one I was good at. Uh, it's a quintessential button masher. Um, so this is the physical development. Um, the upper left-hand corner is the very first like arcade cabinet I ever built because I woke up one day and I told my husband, I'm going to build a cabinet with 100 buttons in it. And he goes, you've never put buttons in anything, <laughs> which, fair. So I um, bought a really lovely cedar chest from Peddler's Mall for $10 and uh, put 16 buttons in it uh, because that seemed like a good start and played like Killer Instinct. Uh, with, a, with like a key remapping, and it was fine, but it wasn't a hundred, so <laughs> or even a thousand. So I bought this um, discontinued IKEA table for children, uh, and I carefully mapped out all 100 buttons on it because that was the max that would fit. And then I drilled them all by hand with a uh, with like a screwdriver and a hole saw, which I, I don't recommend doing. Uh, it was very difficult. And then I didn't know what I was doing, so I drew on top of it, and then nothing would sit on top of it because I drew on it in Sharpie. So I used tabletop bar top resin, 
And, but I didn't want the resin to go through the holes, so I cut out a bunch of candles and shoved them in the holes and then poured epoxy on top of it, and then you've got candles in it, so you've got to set it on fire. Um, so, uh, I, don't, I don't come from a woodworking background. Uh, I have a degree in English literature. Uh, so, yeah, so that was most of the physical development. And then we settled on uh, this guy, who is uh, sententable. So. The one on the left is the big IKEA table version I, I take, and I say that like the one on the right isn't basically the same size, but the one on the right is a travel version, and it's travel because um, I cut it in half, and then, and then it folds into a suitcase, and then, yeah, I can set it up in about five minutes. There are videos on YouTube of me doing it, so it's very impressive. The first time I did it was for a show in South Korea, I had three weeks of lead time, and they were, they were like, oh, can you come? And I was like, yeah, but at that point, I didn't have a version of the board that I could put on a plane. So I took the smaller one, and I just cut it in half. And the most impressive thing in the world is like showing up with a suitcase and like opening it and just like unfurling 100 arcade buttons. Um, but yeah, and then, um, so I guess, like, where has it been? Um, it's been to, it's been shown in three continents and like four countries, if you count the US, which I am. Uh, so I took it to Out of Index in South Korea. I took it to Feral Vector in England. Um, it's, it went to the Hand Eye Society Fancy Dress Ball in Toronto. And also it was at the Smithsonian with Death by Audio this year, which is pretty cool. So Centenable is a table. <laughs> Uh, and so we started thinking about ways to build a cabinet, which was basically the button board plus a screen and an amp all in one. And we started thinking about cabinet designs. And uh, I guess this joust cabinet is sort of what we started with. Although if you notice, there's only two buttons on this cabinet, uh, which is 98 less than we had. And so we had to figure out a way to both fit all of the buttons and a screen into a table. So there were a lot of <laughs> sketches on how this could be done. Uh, and we wanted to have a good experience for people playing the game, <coughs> and do they sit across from each other? You know, where are the buttons in relation to the screen? Uh, I think this first one on the left would have had to have been this really massive table that um, we probably wouldn't be able to fit through doors. Uh, and then we talked about upright cabinets for a while. So on the right-hand side, you see these like cabinets that are just covered in buttons on the sides. Um, this one I like a lot with this gigantic console, uh, which probably would have made this whole thing topple forward. Um, but we really wanted to design for portability because we were taking our cabinets to a lot of shows and we wanted to not rent as many box trucks as we have been renting. Uh, so we were like, how can we make this fit in the back of an SUV? We'll take an SUV, but uh, we didn't want to have to bring it places in a big truck. This was kind of the first iteration. Uh, this was designed by Kyle and um, this was sort of okay, except when you realize how far away you were from the screen, you probably wouldn't have been able to see it. But it sort of gave us this idea where, okay, if two people are sitting in front of it at once, um, maybe if they could see the screen, this would be the way to do it. Uh, and so we started playing around with button layouts. How could we fit 100 buttons into the smallest amount of space? And we kind of settled on this design. Uh, and you'll notice there's no kind of delineation between player one and player two, um, but we decided to use different colored buttons to do that and just keep as, the buttons as close together as possible. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the tools that you can use to build an arcade cabinet kind of in a generic sense. Yeah, you're uh, you know here to learn how to build an arcade cabinet, so in a general sense, uh, it's actually, you know, pretty easy. It, it depends on what you have access to already. Uh, and if you don't have access to some of these things, your options are, 
you know, making the investment in some tools, or if you live in or near a city, you probably have a local makerspace that you can find, and they definitely have these things and more. Uh, but really, uh, you just need, a, uh, I would recommend a table saw. It's the superior saw, but if you only have a circular saw, you can make it work with uh, just that. Jigsaw is uh, useful. Jigsaw or bandsaw is useful for some fine detail cutting. And then you need a router, mostly for any fun shapes you make or any cutouts like our screen cutout. Your buttonholes could be a router. Uh, any inset, really, is going to be a router. Uh, we used a CNC table, full disclosure for this because we didn't want to hand drill 100 buttons. I don't know who would do that. Uh, it took two weeks. And ours <laughs> took 15 minutes because a computer did it. Uh, but you don't need a CNC table to build an arcade machine. Essentially, it's just uh, you know trading time for technology. Uh, um, oh, good question. I'm going to fast forward and show you. So uh, we had access to this machine. This is a, the model is a Shapeco XXL. It can do 32 inches by 32 inches. I'm gonna make sure I'm muted. Uh, oh man. Because there are no subtle CNC machines. And basically you design a file in Illustrator or another CAD program. You save it and you send it to the computer and the computer will cut out your shape. The computer just has a router attached to. It's basically like a bit on the end of a machine and it goes slowly down and it kind of just like cuts down. Yeah. So you could route this by hand as well and do the same thing, but uh, this is just a computer that has a router on a three axis machine. It's similar. It works on the same axes, but instead of like filament, it's a router. So, so it's, yeah, removing. Yeah, and you basically screw a sheet of plywood down. Uh, I, I don't, I think don't so. know. I don't think so. Probably. I think 3D printers all extrude. I mean, mostly the similarities with a 3D printer and a CNC are the three axis elements to it. So a lot of them do that that sort of similar movement. Um, but they're they're fundamentally different machines. I'm sure someone out there has routed like the elements of a 3D printer onto like a CNC because it sounds hilarious. Um, but they are they are fundamentally different machines. Like he was saying, there's a CNC is elements of removing material, and a 3D printer is usually adding material. Yeah. You could you know attach a sharpie to the end of this and draw things. Like you can do different things. You don't have to put the router on the end, um, which is kind of the, the cool thing about a CNC machine. Um, but we use this for the screen uh, and the table legs. And so the constraint for us was everything has to fit on this table. So that's why the 32 by 32 was sort of our, uh, what we designed around. Yeah. Again, if you don't have access to a CNC, you can totally make an arcade machine. I just don't recommend making one with 100 buttons. <laughs> um, and you can probably get access to a CNC machine through like maker spaces. Some libraries have them. Yeah. Question down there. Like a water jet table? Yeah. Yeah. Question? Uh, patent, like the arcade machines? Yeah. We haven't. Uh, the games are, are owned by the developers. Um, we sort of, like the cabinets are co-owned by the group, the organization, and the developers. Um, but we haven't applied for any patents or anything like yeah. that. Okay. Cabinet design is open source. You can have it if you want. Yeah, it's got it's kind of stuff we just found on the internet. I yeah. used to joke with like the hundred button project, but if someone really, really wanted to take it, they I mean they can try. It's really <laughs> it's a hundred buttons. <laughs> um. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a lot of work. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a pretty short tool list. These aren't you know you need a fastener method, you need a saw, more saws are preferable, uh, and you need a router or a CNC. Uh, disposable materials you're going to need plywood, some fastener and wood glue, and then finishing materials like spackle, sandpaper, paint, whatever you want to do to it. But it's actually it's a pretty short materials list. Yeah, uh, I don't love working with MFD. Uh, it's really heavy for not a great reason, and it sort of disintegrates when you're doing fine work around it. Uh, I would just use, I mean, we used a mix of three quarter and half inch, just furniture grade ply. Yeah, avoid like CDX, which is what they use when they're like building houses. You can yeah. tell because it looks like it's a bunch of scraps glued together. It's like chipwood. Yeah. yeah. So we always buy sanded plywood, which is really smooth and it's easy to paint on. But yeah, if you're, I mean, if you ask for furnish grade or AC ply, you'll be fine. Me? Yeah. Um. For, for me, like the, the scraps are like um, these ragged donuts of like donut holes of like uh, like shitty plywood. So they mostly went into like either, depending on which material it was and depending on which time. For me, they either went to compost or like stuff like that. Oh, the fit, you mean what the thing is made of? Mm. Who? Uh, so what, it, what helps is that I usually buy my IKEA used. So you get a nicer quality table for like $10 at a Goodwill. So um, it really depends. I usually check the tables out because you can tell what's a good IKEA table and what's a shit IKEA table, usually by virtue of like, does it feel heavy? And um, the downside to that is that it's usually not the greatest thing to drill through. Um, I just like it because there's a lot of like just spare parts lying around. So if something breaks, like a screw or something, you, you can usually find someone who's selling it because it's an Ikea table. I would also say like, uh, we're gonna have a cost breakdown at the end. We, we spent about, I don't know, $150 on plywood. Yeah. Something like that. So, you know, you, I would say you can probably get Ikea furniture and cut it up and save some money. Um, if it like works for what you want to do. Uh, the, the trick here is like, if you spend more money, you can make it look nicer. But that's, you know, It will not you. look like a hacked together Ikea table. And also <laughs> to be fair, like my version also doesn't have space for like, and there aren't very many tables where you could also have like a screen in them. So it works really well for my case because it's basically a controller interface, but it's a different, it's a different beast. Yeah. Um. So after the woodworking components, uh, these are some standard arcade components that you would need. Um, a computer and a screen. All of our arcades just run on a computer. Uh, for this one, we'll be using an Intel NUC, uh, N-U-C, which runs somewhere between $300 and $500. It's a mini PC. Um, and we run most of our games on Windows 10, though you can use Linux. Uh, if you want, you could spend a lot of money on a Mac Mini and use that. I don't recommend it. Um, but Android. basically, oh yeah, Android is something we've been experimenting with. Uh, we found something called an NVIDIA Shield. Um, we are kind of still troubleshooting it, but it's a little bit cheaper, uh, maybe $150. And it's also very small, which was a design constraint for this project because we're building a table, not a full-size cabinet. How can we get the smallest hardware in like, there? A nook is about this big. Yeah. So for a PC, that's that's pretty small. Um, it's a little like, it's a little like, cakey size, but it's it's not that big. And if you're building a standard upright cabinet, you can really just put a PC tower in there because it's a really big empty box. There's space for it. No. <laughs> Go to the Indie Arcade and count the activate Windows messages. 
Uh, but uh, we've started playing around with Linux a little bit and building for Ubuntu, and um, it's a little bit more uh, troubleshooting, especially with hardware. Uh, but it's you know you get rid of that message. But yeah, it's annoying. Uh, also, you know, for this kind of stuff, I would say eBay and Craigslist are your friends. Um, we've found a lot of great stuff used, especially screens. Um, you can find computers at like, you know, donation places. Uh, offices are getting rid of Windows 7 computers, which will run most games. Especially if you're doing, you know, MAME stuff, you could run that on a Raspberry Pi, which is $40. So, you know, you don't need to spend $300 on a computer. You could start small and then upgrade. Uh, for electronics, you'll probably need a soldering iron and solder, as Alan is doing over here. Uh, you won't need to solder 100 buttons. You'll probably need to solder like three. Uh, it won't take as long. Wire cutters, wire strippers. Yes? So, so Raspberry Pi will work with composite analog video uh, through the headphone jack, actually. So you would get, um, there's an adapter that has like the headphone jack to like three RCA cables and you could use that to go into a composite video signal. You might have to do some configuring on the Raspberry Pi to do that, but that's. Uh, yeah, it, it looks fine. I've, I've seen it before. It doesn't look terrible or anything. It's pretty clear. Yeah, I don't Depends know. Depends on the quality of your CRT, like a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know the resolution offhand, but um, it will do analog if you tell it to. It's it's NTSC video, 640, 480, you know, standard yeah. definition. At, at 11 p.m., Alan is doing a talk about analog video, so if you're interested, <laughs> go to that act, talk. Should have just asked the video artist. <laughs> Get that guy. Um, yes. Yeah, laptops are tough because of the dual screen, right? Like, because the laptop has an internal screen, and sometimes, you know, if you're trying to maximize the game window, it goes to your laptop screen, or sometimes, like, displays switch. Um, you know, the normal stuff that you get if you plug a laptop into a projector is the same stuff you would get in the arcade. Um, also, I've had luck, in, the, in that case, I've had luck with laptops where, like, you know, you've damaged the screen out, and so then you just kind of, like, I've, I've done that before, where you have like a laptop, just like the body of a laptop, and you just use the anything as the screen. So you make it its primary screen. We've also had the issue where like the power falls out of the laptop because it's like magnetic or something, and then this, it goes to sleep, and that's happened several times. I think you might have said. Yeah, I was just going to add uh, laptops in the wall water, so if you're in close space with like the Got half of it's a fan. Um, so yeah, um, you know, soldering uh, is a technique that uh, you can watch some YouTube videos, learn how to do. It's not terribly hard. Um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Uh, screwdrivers are handy for you know, screwing things together. The, the things we're using, I'll show you in a little bit, have screw terminals for attaching all the wires. Um, buttons and joysticks, we got 100 buttons from eBay for $100, which was a crazy good deal. It's a very good deal. Um, so I would encourage you to look on eBay for buttons. There's all sorts of different buttons out there. If there's Street Fighter aficionados, I'm sure you know about the differences between buttons. Um, you could spend a dollar on buttons, you could spend five dollars on buttons. Uh, joysticks are a little bit of a different beast. Uh, we don't have any in this build, so we're not going to talk about them that much. But they could go from like ten bucks to twenty-five bucks, uh, depending on what you want to do with them. There are analog joysticks uh, available, and um, they are sixty dollars but they plug in with a USB, and so if you wanted to build something with analog, you can. It's just tends to be on the expensive side. 
We also used an amp and speakers for our sound and a microcontroller, which in our case is an Arduino. Uh, Amanda wrote the software and um, well, um, uh, Shay Rembold uh, wrote the software for the Arduino. Okay. But th thank you. I'd love taking credit for his work. He's a very talented programmer. We'll have a link to the code yeah. a little later and you can look at it. Um, if you are not so much of a coder, there is a device called an iPack and this is something you can buy and there's software that you download and you can just click on what buttons do what keys on the keyboard. So you could say this button is spacebar, this button is Z, this button's A. Uh, really plug and play, you don't have to do anything at all. And most of our arcades have those inside. Also Teensy's. Socks would want you to mention Teensy's. Teensy's great, uh, similar to Arduino, but it works a lot better. No, two. So there are two Arduino Mega 2650s. Um, they're these big. They're these big boys. They have individual ports. So with um, 100 buttons, you can either keyboard matrix or something like that. There are a couple different routes you can go. I wanted each button to respond and feel like its own thing. And with like a keyboard matrix, you press one. If someone presses one next to it, it doesn't like respond as well. So. Um, the easiest way to do, we tested a bunch of different stuff originally, but the easiest thing to do is, um, it was to p assign them individually to individual ports on an Arduino. So there are a hundred wires going to a hundred different ports, but yeah, they're split for, to make it easier for the computer, they're sp split so one Arduino is player one and ar one Arduino is player two. Mm-hmm. So a Mega 2650, the reason it picked it is it actually has um, 54, I think, individual like sections. And there's on my actual board, there's only 49 on each, but still, like it's enough ports. Oh, there's another person. Oh, sorry. So funny enough, I used to work at a place called the Beam Center where Alan works. And uh, yeah, we've taught Arduino to two kids in the New York City School District. And I've taught it in Kentucky. So that, that's a different system, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to get down to the build now. Fabricating. Yeah. Nate, so you want to talk about PPE? Sure. This is the, uh, the last set of equipment you need to build an arcade cabinet. It's personal protective equipment. Uh, Generally, whenever you're working with saws or power tools, uh, you need a short list of things, which is eye protection, ear protection, and a respirator if you're doing something that requires that. Uh, it's all super cheap. It's all super useful because you need to not go deaf and not go blind. Uh, so get yourself safety glasses. Get yourself, uh, I have in-ears here. You can also just get the big old headphones. doesn't matter. And then I have a respirator on in this photo because I was sanding in a very small room and you don't want to breathe sawdust for hours. It's, it's not good for you. They also have those disposable yeah. dust masks as well. Uh, if you don't have a respirator, those are pretty cheap. Yeah. So we already talked about the shape of co. So let's talk about how we built the rest of this. Yeah. Um, generally, when you are building uh, you start with a draft, which you saw before, our design schema, basically, and then you have to take that uh, design rendering and you have to say, quite literally, how do I build this? Uh, and the trick to, um, let me give you the trick to all woodworking, uh, everything we make is a box, every single thing. Uh, when you make a more interesting shape, it's just a different box. So you take the draft and you say, how do I make boxes out of this, which you see on the right there is the table box and the screen box. Uh, and then you just, on that scale drawing, say literally what cuts of wood do I need. You make a cut list beforehand, so you make sure you buy the right amount of wood. Uh, and then once you have a cut list, you cut it. Um, generally, long strips, you're just going to run them on your table saw if you have one uh, and cut your larger tabletop shapes on a table saw as well. You can use a chop saw or a circular saw, anything you have on hand to cut them to the correct length after you have you know, the width. If you don't have a table saw too, you could have a circular saw 
and just clamp a two by four or something yeah. as a guide and just run it along the two by four. And that way, you know, table saw is kind of a big piece of equipment that not a lot of people have. So yeah. you, you can do this in a garage. And so here's our first box. Yeah, you take those pieces and uh, you put them together into a box. Uh, generally in assembly, you either, you always want wood glue because that's actually what holds wood together. Uh, and then you can either screw or we, uh, Brad nailed this whole thing because uh, they have a lower profile when you cover them up. But uh, you just, yeah, make a box. And this is the, the lid, you can see. Uh, we framed out the screen so that it wouldn't slide around on the inside. Um, and then we just covered that with the piece that we see in seed, and that's how the screen was held in place. And then we made another box. Yeah, uh, the bottom box, same process. Uh, cut at the same time as the top box to make sure they would be the same size. But it is just another box with uh, rails for the controller board to sit on. It's just press fit in there. And uh, two side rails, and we had extra space. So we were like, uh, you know, cup holders. When you're building something with electronics, make it accessible. Don't screw everything together, because if something breaks, you need to get at the electronics. So it's really important that the button panel actually could lift out. So if we had to work on it, we could. Um, and so a lot of the arcade cabinets we have have like a little door in the back with yeah. a little latch or some way to open it. So if the computer dies, something gets unplugged, some wire breaks, we could fix it. Yeah, in a more general sense, if you're making a standard arcade cabinet on the console, you're either going to want the lid to be press fit or just hinged because you're going to want to get under the hood. Here's the two boxes sitting on top of each other. And you'll notice the holes because we needed to get the screen uh, HDMI and power from the top box to the bottom box. So we ran a cable uh, through the bottom of one box into the back of the other box. Yeah, uh, this picture also shows you our last sort of very interesting design constraint that we had for this project because the whole goal of making it a table both for you know reasonable how do you get 100 buttons on and because it's an accessible game we wanted it to be physically accessible as well uh, is that for a table, uh, there's a range of heights basically that is an ADA compliant, you have a normal table. But also, uh, there's a human constraint of like how tall a table needs to be to get your legs under it. And generally with a table, that's not a problem because it's one inch thick. But here, we have to fit a bunch of buttons and controllers and then also a screen. So we ended up with this uh, design space of how do we make basically the thinnest boxes that can contain all the materials we need and set them at a height that you can fit your knees under where the tabletop won't be, you know, unreasonably tall. So after we finished building, uh, we filled all the holes. Nate filled all the holes. Yep. Uh, it's not technically required. I would tell you that it is required for anything you make out of wood because you want it to look nice. Uh, just you know, spackle or wood fill all of your holes. And this is also the secret to making nice uh, square boxes is if you don't assemble super well, uh, any, any misalignment problem can be solved with enough wood putty and sanding. Uh, to get your knees under it, you want the base of the table, what did we end up on? Uh, you want the base of the table to be around 24 inches tall underneath it. And then your tabletop, you want it to be somewhere between 26 and 30. It was a very small range we had to work with. And we actually had to add an inch, I think. Yeah, we did. Uh, to fit stuff. Then we had to add a hinge to the back. Um, you know, this thing, we wanted it to open and close um, for easy transport. Um, we were also thinking about this, like, you know, we wanted this to collapse and be able to fit somewhere, so uh, this, wanted, this had to close at some point. So this is the hinge, and this line indicated how little space we had to install this hinge. <laughs> and then paint. Yeah, uh, you're going to finish your cabinet in some way. Uh, painting it is probably your cheapest option, uh, but generally, uh, you know, you're going to prime the whole thing after you fill in sand. 
and then pick a color. We've got a black box, and then I just primed a top surface because we had an artist who was doing the button panel and the top of the box when it's closed. Uh, you could also uh, vinyl it. You could order custom vinyl to apply to it, but that starts to be more expensive, but is another you know finishing option for your box. The inside of this box is also uh, blacked generally a good standard for anything that you're going to put electronics inside of is to take flat black and mix uh, fireproofing with it. And they just There's liquid fireproofing you can buy. It's pretty cheap. You mix it one to ten and then when you paint the inside you also make your project fireproof. Just in case. Uh, speaking of vinyl, we didn't use any vinyl on this project but there's a pretty cheap website called Game on Graphics. G-R-A-F-I-X and uh, they sell side art for arcade cabinets and marquees that are pretty cheap uh, compared to other places I've found in person. Um, and we just got side art for Kung Fu Kickball uh, made there. So if you're interested in vinyl printing, uh, check that place out. Vinyl printing gives you that more like classic arcade feel. That's like the pretty, like that's what people think of when they think of like the side of a cabinet. Though a lot of them are actually just painted solid colors. Yeah, sometimes it's more fun to paint it if you can paint. Yeah. We, we couldn't paint, so we found an artist. Generally, I would say that if you are trying to recreate like a sort of classic arcade vibe, you either want to vinyl screen print it or uh, something that we've been talking about doing in the future is you want to laminate your wood. Um, if you, you know, want to show off its homemadeness or just do it the cheapest way, then you're going to paint your cabinet. Uh, so here is the other surface that we primed. Uh, the artist painted uh, the button board and the top. And after the panel, you can walk up and kind of look at it. Um, it's gorgeous. It's really beautiful. I have photos of it as well. Uh, so installing the screen speakers. Um, so a bunch of stuff was kind of getting trapped in the lid. So this was a picture of the speakers that got installed. Um, we bought these on Amazon. Uh, they are, I think, $12 each. Uh, if you're looking for speakers, look for car speakers. Those are the size that you want. And you can get really nice grills that cover them on the front side. You can see on, on the cabinet itself. Those are like five bucks a piece. Um, and so this, is, this is, goes against what I said earlier where you don't want to trap your electronics. But uh, because this was going to be the lid, we had to screw this stuff closed. Um, so I had to test everything and make sure it worked before I screwed the lid together. This screen mask is also relatively accessible though. You don't want to, you know, pop it open every time you open up the box, but it's just a couple screws tacking this whole panel in. So if you need if need be, you can just pop it out and get to everything behind it. And this hinge, you know, wasn't going to hold this lid open. So we got these support hinges which uh, if you have fancy kitchen cabinets, you're probably familiar with them. You open it and it just holds the lid open. So these were capable of holding about uh, 50 pounds of weight. Um, the problem was that we couldn't actually install them because the screen spanned the entire width. So I had to actually take this piece off, run through the table saw and cut the sides off. You could see on the actual cabinet itself so we could add these support hinges. And so here's a video of that working, although I can show you this. In, in person. In a standard design, you won't need this sort of structure because you'll just have a full standing console and screen on your box. But, you know, you might want to make uh, a collapsible box of your own, or you'll also need to be installing hinges somewhere else in your cabinet, like in the console. Yeah, this can also be how to build a chest. Yeah. It's a box. Uh, we got uh, some. Uh, kind of cable wrap, uh, also from Amazon, because it was HDMI, power, and the two speaker cables. So we had kind of this bundle of cable coming out the back, and uh, this stuff just wraps around cables, um, and you've probably seen this in like other AV setups. It just keeps everything nice and clean. Uh, and then this amplifier uh, that we got for the speakers, about $20 on Amazon. This is in every single arcade cabinet that we've built. Uh, it gets pretty loud and it can plug in with just a headphone jack. So you can see this is, these are the clips for the speaker wires and there's power right here. 
Uh, on the other side is the volume control, so we can adjust this if we pop the button board out. And uh, then we had to design the legs. Yes? This is called Lepi, L-E-P-Y. Um, and it's just an amp that we tried once and it was great. It worked really well and it's never given us problems. Um, you can also use computer speakers. It's like an all-in-one solution. Um, but this is nice because you can put the speakers wherever you want and you don't have to touch them. And then the amp could be more accessible to adjust volume. With computer speakers, you kind of have to like get to them to adjust them, which is, can be annoying. So for the legs, we had a couple other design constraints to think about. This was the CAD design that we cut out. And the reason for this notch at the bottom was because when they were folding, they actually were going to hit our hinges. So we had to cut out a part that would sit uh, inside the hinge. Yeah, the, the goal was you know, to make it portable, to make the legs as collapsible as possible, as low profile as possible. Uh, and also, you want that notch cut out on any leg, even if you're not having a hinge problem, because if you have a straight 24 inch run of wood, you're gonna have trouble leveling that on any floor, whereas if you basically create two little feet out of it, it's much easier to get it to sit. The other problem we were having is if both legs were mounted both with the same hinges, they would hit each other, or like one would fold and the other wouldn't like kind of go all the way up. So we actually moved a set of hinges down so one leg would fold under the other. Yeah. And so if you look under this cabinet, there's a block of wood so that when we fold this up, one leg folds up and the other folds up and it can sit flat. And we installed this uh, at Magfest the, uh, the other day. And it actually worked. And so these hinges lock in place. Um, and they were super easy to install. We just screwed them down and we screwed them into the legs and that was it. And so this was the artist that we uh, talked to. Uh, Nate and I were in our shop and we walked out into the hallway and started chatting with our neighbors and they said, we have an artist in our studio right now. She came over and she said, do you like my work? And we said, yes. And so we hired her. <laughs> yeah. She, also she could do it in she, yeah, uh, she also was like, I could finish that before MAGFest. It's important to us. Yeah, her website is evelynpark.rocks, uh, which is great because Amanda also has a .rocks website. Do. Domain buddies. Um, but yeah, you can come and see the art up close. Yeah. Generally for yours, you know, you can do your own art, hire a local artist, I recommend it. Uh, and then install the buttons. We did this yesterday. Uh, this was really tedious, and we're still working on it. Uh, you know, buttons just have a little washer, so we screwed them all on, uh, and then we started soldering. With a button wrench. With a button wrench. Oh, essential. Oh, uh, that was so useful. So I didn't know about this the first two times I put in buttons. Um, the, again, there are a hundred of them. Uh, so uh, that's a button wrench. Uh, you can buy it for like $7 on Amazon, and it just, it's a it's a wrench. I don't know why that's really surprising to me, but it's amazing. It's uh it's not an essential for a normal project, but it's if very you have a hundred buttons, it is essential. It's very essential. <laughs> and so how how uh, in electronics, when you have a button, you need two wires to go to the button. Uh, one for the electrical ground. So when you press the button, it basically connects the data wire to the ground wire. So the uh, Arduino knows that a button has been pressed. So all of the blue buttons, the grounds had to be soldered together. And you could see this if you want to come up here later and look at the board. All the red buttons, the grounds had to be soldered together. And then each button had to have a wire going from the button to the Arduino. So it's a lot of soldering. I should also clarify, I, I don't solder. I use, um, I use little, um, and they're probably, they're really standard if you buy an arcade harness but they make these little um, things that like slide on to your, or to your individual buttons. So you don't have to solder. And a lot of, those, a lot of systems for like iPacks and stuff don't require solder, if that's like a terrifying prospect. Yeah, there are uh, arcade crimps 
I think a lot of them you can just buy. You can buy them in bulk on Amazon. They're they're tiny and red, and you can buy like a hundred for like five dollars. And you essentially just clip your wires onto the uh, the buttons. They're very straightforward. Soldering makes a lot more sense in this case because they're talking about a more permanent. It's not moving nearly as much as my board does, um, and so it makes a lot more sense to have like a hard line like connection. Mine is designed so that if something goes terribly, terribly wrong, I don't have to bring soldering across like uh, government lines. <laughs> also, you know, now that we have arcades in a bar and uh, we have a killer queen machine that gets spilled on pretty often, uh, they use crimp connectors, which uh, Amanda was talking about, which are easy when you have to replace yeah. the electronic component because you could just pull those off, pop the switch out, put a new one on. You don't need to solder it. Um, so in that sense, that can be easier. Uh, so this is a picture of the Arduino, and it's actually upside down uh, attached to this green board, which is just a breakout board for all the pins. Uh, if anyone's worked with Arduino before, it doesn't have permanent connections. It just has like holes to plug into, which can be unplugged really easily. So this board, I think, do you remember the cost? Um, it's kind of expensive. It's a screw port terminal, and it's about $30. It also comes with, I think it's like a server mount thing. It's like this mount. You take it right off and throw it in the garbage. It's super useless for this project. But yeah, it, I think there are cheaper ones if you're building like a smaller thing and not like this huge thing. But they're like $30. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, more, um, I don't speak for him, but in my case, uh, more flexibility. An iPack only goes up to about um, 25 inputs or so. Like, it's not a ton. I need it a lot more. Um, an Arduino is also cheaper than me buying, say, 16 iPacks or something. I priced it at, it's because, like, I have to buy, because in my case, I have so many buttons. So it's also that. It's also they're connected to different things. So they're just different beasts, really, in that case. Also, uh, you know, iPack is pretty much a keyboard, right? So everything you plug into it gets mapped to a keyboard key. So if you wanted to do something more custom, if you wanted to control lights, if you wanted to do like a trackball or, you know, some other interface, the Arduino lets you write custom software. Uh, but there's also really great resources for learning how to use it, and there's example code. So you can just download an example and just alter it slightly. You don't have to be a like master programmer and to use it. While I didn't write the code personally in this Arduino, because we used code from, an, from a previous project that worked really well, so we just didn't have to rewrite it. I have written for Arduino, and it's very straightforward. And it's probably got some of the best um, generalized instructions on the internet. There's, it, whatever you're building, someone has tried before, and they have a video on YouTube, or like an instruction, or an Adafruit tutorial. Um, since we're running short on time, I'm Sorry. just gonna skip to a couple links. So uh, this is a link to the Arduino code for this project, um, and we'll make these slides available as well if anyone's interested in looking at this code. Um, this is also on Amanda's blog, and so we can share that. We actually have not yet programmed the Arduino code because we haven't finished wiring it yet. Um, and then last, we're going to talk about setting up a computer as an installation because a lot of our arcades, when you plug them in, they just boot automatically into software. And so uh, Andy Wallace, who's sitting here, wrote a really nice blog on how to do this specifically for Windows 10. Um, there is also a guide for Mac, and I think there's a guide for Windows 7, but this is pretty... Perfect. Yeah, so this tells you how to disable sleep and like turn off updates and all the stuff that you need if you wanted to make an installation that just boots into software and doesn't like shut off or have pop-ups or anything like that. Um, so we will do this when we're ready to install the software. Um, for the cost breakdown, uh, this cost us roughly a thousand to fourteen hundred dollars. This is a general cost breakdown. Notice, like you know, vinyl can be up to five hundred dollars. Um, I would say a good cost if you're buying 
Hardware is about a thousand if you wanted to build your own arcade. Then again, if you have a computer and a screen at home, if you know someone with a wood shop that has plywood lying around, you could probably get that cost down. Um, right. In general, this cost breakdown is if you had to buy pretty much all of your components. If you have things lying around, it's cheaper. And generally, though there are some limits, you can trade money for time here if you're willing to invest you know, more time in your project personally you know, and you paint the whole thing, uh, you don't need to spend any money on vinyl or art, et cetera. And so with that, um, we'll take questions for the last couple of minutes. Here's all of our contact info. <laughs> We're also at the Indie Arcade in the back of MIVS, so please come and chat with us. We'll be soldering this for the rest of the day, and hopefully <laughs> it will be ready to play. And there's the other, the table version is playable at the Indie Arcade now. Yeah. If you, if you have your own project, if you're curious about what it takes to start a project, you can ask us now for the next couple of minutes, find us in the Indie Arcade, or you know, uh, reach out to us and we'd be happy to help. Yeah? Cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs>